serious, what's the scariest thing that you have experienced that you have proof of? When I was a kid no older than 11 me and my family were on a road trip. My mother had started the day with headaches, but she was fine by the time we had left. Around half an hour and the headaches returned, and they were much worse. It got so bad she had to stop driving and go to the back seat with me. A few minutes later she started talking nonsense and squirming. This is when panic set in. She could not speak words. In absolute terror we drove to the nearest tour, while my struggling mom held my hands. In that moment I was certain my mom was going to die right next to me. However, we got to the hospital, and they were able to help her, and she survived. Turns out she had a stroke. Proof, medical records. It's also weird to think Golden got out at age 21 then later got married and had a kid and had a sort of normal life I'm assuming. He died last year in a car accident coincidentally. The other guy is out there just living his life. Incredible. Right? This shooting had such weird circumstances. I'm not sure, but I think for decades they were the only surviving school shooters who were walking free with a clean record and ability to buy guns. Those were two literal boogeymen from our childhood that many of us feared the very real possibility of running into at the supermarket. It boggles the mind. Part of my trauma manifested in fixating on trying to find them through amateur sleuthing. It wasn't healthy and I thankfully worked past it. It does help that Andrew died in that wreck I hate to say. It's an ugly thought but he escaped true justice for 20 years so fuck him. Thanks for sharing and I'm glad you are better now. That 11 year old photo of you looks so innocent. It breaks my heart to think of what happened you and the others at such a young age, but I totally understand what you mean about amateur sleuthing coming out from trauma. I've done that too. It's weird how that works, isn't it? I was in a car accident with my mill. We hit the back of a loaded log truck. It was weirdly similar to how traumatic events are seen in movies and shit. I remember it like everything was in slow motion without sound. Just before the actual impact I had the weirdest urge slash thought that I needed to plant my leg so my phone would be okay in order to call my, at the time, boyfriend. I didn't think I was going to die or about anything other than I need that phone to call my boyfriend. I assume I was knocked out for a bit because the next thing I remember is suddenly being conscious again, not like waking up but just being aware again. There were logs in between me, the passenger, and my mill, driver. I could only see her chin and hear what sounded like snoring. I was terrified that she would die but it was a muted terror, like, I knew that's how I felt but it was behind a wall. It was on the border of disassociation but not quite there. I couldn't open the door so I climbed out the window and yelled to call 911. The truck driver had already put out road flares and called. I called my boyfriend to tell him what happened. My memory gets quite choppy from there. I remember a very kind nurse who had been driving home from work staying with me on the side of the road while waiting for emergency services to get there. I remember paramedics or firefighters, not sure which, showing up and starting to cut through the metal of my mill's truck to get her out. I told them that the truck had a back door they could open. I guess I just wanted to be helpful. The paramedic slash firefighter thanked me. The wonderful nurse who stayed with me convinced me to go in an ambulance because I didn't know what to do since I wasn't actually hurt. I was extremely calm until the ambulance started moving but the paramedic was really great at distracting me to keep me calm. He noticed my doctor who ringtone so he started to talk to me about the show. It was probably the weirdest mental state I have ever experienced. I remember the paramedic trying to get in four in my left arm but that arm's vein is weird and it hurt a lot. I asked if he could put it in the right one because it has a really great vein, I've had a lot of blood draws in the past. He said yeah but seemed unsure of how because that side was against the wall. So. Helpful, in pain me just yelled, just get on top of me and do it remembering that now always cracks me up. My mill was taken to the hospital by helicopter. She was in the ICU for quite some time but survived. She has some brain damage but it's mostly memory based and getting better every day. She had also lost the ability to taste slash smell but has recently said it's about 70% back. She is quite possibly the nicest and most optimistic person I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. She saved my life by turning the wheel. I had some scratches and body aches but that's all. I will forever be grateful for her existence especially her continued existence. I had a bad fear of driving before the accident and I still have it now. I'm 25 and I've never had a driver's license but I'm working on it. Sorry for the long rambling and unnecessary details. I guess I still haven't gotten over it and it helps to talk about it. It's been around 6 or 7 years so I feel like I should be over it but I guess I'm not there yet. The slow motion is so legit when people think it's exaggerated on TV. I was in an accident when I was 9, 
driving a go-kart on the dirt road in front of my house and got hit by a 17-year-old neighbor who was racing his dad. I very much remember it in slow motion and blacking our before feeling the impact. I came to several minutes later to my mom running towards me after they knocked on the door to tell her there had been an accident. That day still haunts me sometimes because I cried through the first words I could muster before I realized how bad it really was, I wish it was all a bad dream. I wish it was all a bad dream. I could see quite a bit of blood, but I don't remember any pain since my body was experiencing shock. I looked down at my right leg and saw my femur, thigh bone, broken and protruding through the skin, I reached down and rubbed it because in that instance of my mind, I figured I'd never have another chance to touch my own bones. For real. I got in a head-on collision with a combined speed of both cars at about 60 to 70 miles per hour. Someone cut a guy off and he swerved into the lane I was in. There were maybe four cars distance between us and maybe like four seconds from the time we saw each other until the time we crashed. That few seconds felt like minutes. I am not really sure what happened during that time, but it was long enough for us to both hit our brakes and try to turn our cars out of the way of each other's. All I remember is seeing his car in front of me, hitting the brakes, a surprisingly, SP? Quiet crunch sound, looking at a deflating airbag, hearing distant sounding screams, then getting out of my car to see a man in the street screaming at an old couple in a car. Once I got out of my car everything just felt like a dream. Turns out that the guy screaming was the guy I crashed with and he was screaming at the people who cut him off. Neither of us were at fault, as the police could see we both used evasive actions by the way our cars, I guess, came to rest, the older couple was found inside of a Coles across the street after they fled but a standard be tracked where they went. The older couple was actually found to be the cause of the accident. Well that was longer than I expected. DL, doctor, was in a head-on car crash, the seconds leading up to it felt like an hour, else that day felt like I was just floating along in a dream. I've posted this before, definitely more creepy than scary though. A couple of years ago I rented an apartment that was in a massive old architecture style building, no idea how old it was. I remember when I did the showing they showed me a door that had an elaborate staircase that went straight up to the ceiling and explained that it went to the attic, which was sealed up. When I was finally moving out curiosity got the best of me and I pushed on the panel at the top of the stairs until it popped open and hoisted myself up there. It was completely dark and the floor was covered in at least an inch of dust, and I found that it was an entire extra floor to my unit. There was some old rotting furniture and magazines littered throughout the rooms. I eventually found a small hole in one of the walls that went into the sealed off upstairs of the unit next to mine and decided to go through that one too. I found a smaller hole at the back end of that area that led to the next one. I eventually made my way through about 5 or 6 of these sealed off spaces that had no entrances save these small holes and drywall. The farther I went in, the older the furniture I found, fridges from the 50s or earlier, old dishware, and so much dust over everything. The last unit was the most interesting. Hand-painted scenes on the walls and holes to the attic letting sunlight stream in. I took small videos but they're all on Snapchat so they're hard to post. I must have been up there for hours just exploring alone in the dark. I was pretty lucky to have the only room with access up there. I took snippets of video on Snapchat, wish I would have taken more pictures. HTTPS colon slash slash com slash a slash dz geef. One evening I was with a couple of friends in my school to cook for an event. When we realized that we were still needing stuff, I jogged towards the nearest grocery store, well ran. I had just left the school ground and was running around a street corner when I suddenly saw two police officers right in front of me, like 1,5 meters. I have to add that it was also pretty dark. They were as scared as me I assume, because one of them immediately drew his sidearm, but didn't point it directly at me. For me as a German this was a hell of a shock because I hadn't had any contact with weapons till that point. Anyways. I immediately put my hands up and behind my head, because I definitely didn't want to get shot by a scared police officer, especially not with 17 years. After I explained why I was running and where I wanted to go, they apologized and I could go. It wouldn't be until I went to bed when I realized that I could have been shot there. I know that the German police handle shooting as a last second option, but seeing a loaded and cocked firearm which is almost pointed at you, scared the shit out of me. But now it's a pretty cool party story. Yeah. Bit I'm at work, we'll add info to this later. Edit. My day one of symptoms was March 11th. Remember, this was at the very start of the pandemic, here in the US. Italy, Spain, Iran, China, South Korea, some other places had been hit pretty hard already, but in the good old US of A. We were still pretty blind to what the possibilities were. Anyway, 
March 10th and 11th were my days off from work, I spent them running errands, cleaning, relaxing, normal weekend stuff. I went grocery shopping on the 11th to make green chili chicken enchiladas for dinner, and started feeling a little rundown hustling through the store. When my girlfriend got home I told her I was too tired to cook, so we went out for pho instead, because when a cold is on the horizon spicy foods usually help keep it at bay. Next morning, I was fluish, so I called out sick, lather, rinse, repeat on Friday the 13th. Basic bad flu symptoms, tired, sore muscles and joints, runny nose, cough. I felt a little better on Saturday the 14th, do I went to work. That night, one of my co-workers was confirmed corona positive, so the leadership at work emailed and texted everyone that we were shutting down to deep clean the office, which for me meant that I could just sleep the next day and get over this damn flu. The next day, it got worse, loss of appetite, mental fogginess, my poop was a weird yellow color, and extreme weakness to the point I couldn't pick up my phone to check for updates from work. My boss called me to let me know we were shutting down until at least Thursday, and would most likely be working from home for the duration, but it would be a few days while IT got kits together. Great. More time to heal. All these symptoms just get worse over the next week, and I'm using the telehealth app from my insurance provider to get treatment, because I hadn't needed a doctor in years, and my old doctor had retired. Each time I had a remote session with a doctor they told me to stay home, take ibuprofen for the inflammation and keep taking a leave D for the flu symptoms, and because I didn't have shortness of breath to not go to the doctor or hospital because I would be turned away. I was prescribed Augmentin because I sent to have a sinus infection, Augmentin has to be taken with food, but the main side effect is nausea or vomiting, so twice a day when I had enough energy to rest two mandarin oranges and some applesauces take my pills, and shortly afterwards vomit it all back up. Because we were back to work slash working from home I needed a doctor's note to go out on short-term disability at work, so I spent a day calling every doctor on the health insurance website to see if they were taking new patients, and got an appointment for Thursday March 26th. At the doctor's office they listened to my lungs, and heard fluid. Yay! Pneumonia. They took a sample to test for corona. They wanted a chest x-ray to check the spread of pneumonia, but it took about 40 minutes because the x-ray machine was malfunctioning. Mind you, It had been almost two weeks at this point that I had sat up for longer than it took to go to the bathroom. I was pretty tired by the time they took me to the x-ray room. They had me stand up against the wall for the chest x-ray, and I got a little dizzy and reached out to steady myself. Next thing I know, there's nurses and doctors crowding around me because I had passed out and hit my head. They told me I was going to the hospital. Yay! Ambulance ride. At the hospital, I was retested for corona, given a Z-pack to treat the pneumonia had an EKG to test my heart function, and a lot of blood taken for other tests, and placed on oxygen because my oxygenation was in the mid-70s. Good oxygenation is 99 or 100, down around 80 you run the risk of passing out and I was below that. They called me presumed positive, and checked me into the COVID ICU, with the acknowledgement that if the test was negative I'd be moved to another ward. I was given intravenous anti-clotting medication, and a shot of a different anti-clotting medication in my belly. They checked on me regularly and had to completely gown, glove, and mask up each time. I was consulted about hydrocalquimine, but decided against it because of the cardiac risks. Because the ZPAC, clotting medicine, and oxygen were helping move my oxygenation numbers up into the mid-90s, they discharged me on home oxygen therapy with visits from a home care nurse. I was quarantined for 21 days, a week longer than the normal quarantine. I still have long-term effects. Chronic fatigue, shortness of breath, loss of appetite, intermittent rash, cough, runny nose, muscle and joint pain, mental fogginess. But almost every day is better than yesterday. On the plus side, I had several people reach out to me to make sure I would have food and supplies. And I was paid to stay home and recover for 8 weeks. Every day is a challenge. But life is good. It was a week and a half into the pandemic and people were still very unsure what was coming. Like the point where people were withdrawing and hiding cash in their homes stockpiling food and maybe even keeping a weapon next to their bed. It was almost midnight and my BF and I were up watching Tiger King in my apartment. All of a sudden we are surrounded by deep booming noises that are shaking the walls and floor. We were disoriented and couldn't figure out what was happening at first was someone trying to knock my door in? Was someone throwing big pieces of furniture down the apartment building stairs? The booms continued. We saw flashing blue and red lights reflected on the walls and looked out the window to see firefighters in masks and oxygen tanks and random neighbors running out and down the alley with pets in their arms. We grabbed essentials, 
threw on our jackets and went out the back door. I yelled to a firefighter, down below in the alley, should we be vacating? He said, stay there, we'll have someone come check. It turns out there was a gas leak in the building and the utility room was directly beneath my apartment. Firefighters were breaking down the door to that room to turn everything off. Firefighters checked the apartment and told us we only had low levels of carbon monoxide and to open all the windows and not go to sleep for another hour. We were so filled with adrenaline at that point we stayed up and finished Tiger King. That reminds me of when I went trekking in a beautiful forest in the Dominican Republic. I asked our guides at the beginning if we'd be encountering any water above 2 or 3 feet because I'm short and I can't swim. He said no, and we went on our way. It was great, exciting. But then we got to a steep cliff that ended in a drop into deep, raging water. He looked at us and said, so, we have to jump. I froze, looking between him and my husband. My husband looked at me like it'll be fine and I looked at him like I will kill you I told you I did not want to do this. The guide pointed out that we could try to go around but it would be far more risky. So he jumped. His co-guide who spoke no English jumped. My husband jumped. They were all treading water at the bottom, looking up at me and yelling to jump. Three men yelling at a 5 foot 2, 125 pounds, at the time, woman who could not swim and was terrified of drowning to jump. I knew I had no other options. I knew I'd either jump wrong and knock myself out and that might be it, or I'd feel like I was helplessly drowning for a few seconds. After what felt like 30 minutes, maybe closer to 10, I held my breath and jumped. It is perhaps the most daring thing I've ever done, but it may have traumatized me. All I remember is being pulled up by the three men and gasping for air slash thrashing my body like a fish out of water. This was five years ago and I still haven't learned to swim. At night on Christmas, seeing my neighbor's house spewing fire from all windows, while their mom is screaming for help from inside. After celebrating Christmas, my family went to sleep, and I was up late. I heard sounds of glass breaking. Wasn't sure at all what the sound could be from at first. My first thought was a truck transporting construction waste went over a speed bump, but as the sound happened again I started walking through the house and looking out to see what it was, because my new thought was that someone is breaking a car's windows with a bat. From the living room, you can see the outside pretty well on all other sides, but not northwards. Didn't see anything happening outside from the living room, so I thought I'd return to my bedroom. It was almost fully dark outside, but as I went back up the stairs, I saw the frosted windows of our stairwell, shining a fully bright red light inside. Then the screams started. My parents were asleep and I immediately went to wake them up, saying the neighbor's house is on fire, call, 911, let's get out. My mom went to get my sister, my dad was calling emergency services. I went to the back of the yard and connected the water hose. Climbed on the wall to their yard, and aimed the hose as best I could toward the closest window which was spewing fire the most. Looking back, that didn't really do much of anything. I am glad I did it, but as soon as I could think fully rationally I knew taking an extinguisher and coming closer I could have done much more. Nevertheless, in this hurried panic state, as I had never experienced anything similar, that was what I tried. The neighbor's wife by now managed to get to the balcony and was screaming for help from there. Every few seconds, fire broke one of the remaining windows. The image of the house as it was at this moment is burned into my mind, along with the aforementioned sight of our stairwell at night being lit bright red from the outside. An, obviously unprofessional, reporter also published the address of the event in the biggest national newspaper, and no one saw anything wrong with that. But because of it, the police notified the injured family that as their address became known, they needed to hire a security firm to guard the house for a few weeks so someone wouldn't try to rob them, although it was all completely charred inside, while my own family had a new problem with some sketchy people coming looking for my dad, because his address had become publicly known, and fearing what else could happen now that it was also easy for someone with sinister intentions to find us. As it was Christmas break at the time, I wasn't going to university and communicated with my friends mostly by phone and social media. Thus it also put into perspective how many of them care enough to reach out, as I'm sure they all had to have heard about it. Some did ask me about it and how we were doing, but most didn't at all. At the New Year's Eve party at one of their homes, I was asked about the incident, and the hurt puppies were pretty much the only thing that got an actual, human, emotional response. One friend commented it was honorable what your dad did. Even considering who he is. How could anyone think that is an okay thing to say? I mean I have my own problems with him and also with him being known, but the guy risked his own life to save another's, and that of a person he was barely on speaking terms with. Can't they admit to themselves they simply wouldn't have done the same? This whole incident taught me on multiple levels, 
that when the situation demands it, some individuals will give their all, but that, most, people in general, will always stay pure shd and deplorable vultures. An unrelated weird, fun? Fact for the end, later I learned that back when I had heard the first shattering glass and saw the bright light, a kid from across the street experienced the same and alerted his mom, to which she responded must be fireworks, let the people enjoy themselves in peace and go to bed. As a child, I got sick regularly, multiple times a year. One time it was a long case of flu. So the doctor asked for a blood test to see if everything is fine with, you know, my blood. For some reason, that required taking it from the vein, which isn't something that should be done to a four-year-old child but Russian medicine apparently doesn't think so. My mom decided to take me to a paid clinic for that. When the nurse started taking the blood, she suddenly found out that she isn't exactly experienced at taking blood from the vein of a four-year-old child which led to some kind of state which isn't exactly clinical death but my skin wasn't exactly the same color either. During this time, I had a vision where I got to observe my dying bluish body from a small distance, as in spectator mode. That took me the rest of the day to recover physically and will likely take my whole lifetime to recover mentally, I can't normally handle syringes anymore, any kind of injection causes me to vomit, if there's nothing to vomit, I just spit belly acid, and takes a few minutes to recover without passing out. I was a passenger in a three-car accident in rural Oregon, one fatality in another car, fault of the driver in my vehicle. I deeply regret not telling him to slow down. My femur was shattered in a way that was brushing against my femoral artery, I would have bled out internally if it was punctured. A second car hit us at 70 miles per hour and it didn't puncture. It took nearly a year to physically recover to 70% of what I was before, the mental scars are forever. I had unknowingly lawyered my way to a settlement, wanted medical paid for, the following autumn, I was barely healed but feeling capable in the next summer in the backcountry. The other passenger from the initial collision and I literally crossed paths when I was guiding in the Cascades, who was the son of the driver who died. I was in helping clear people medically and I was flipping through the forms and saw the name and nearly froze. The kid was standing in front of me, I cleared him but had to ask about the car accident. I maintained anonymity until I chatted with their adult leader, who appreciated the candor. Everyone decided mutually it was better for us not to talk, and let him enjoy his experience. I lead an expedition and returned, the kid was leaving because he wasn't having a good time. I was smoking a cigarette next to the gate of the property and watched him drive away. The kid was staring right at me. That look was the scariest thing that I've ever seen. It was a week before the one year anniversary of his father's death, caused by my friend driving. We never talked. The lawyers representing that family had a settlement that I cut it into from the My Driver's Insurance Co. In my mind I had taken money from that child, until I realized that some things are out of my control and I had to forge my own path. Money came and went, but I did do good with it. The chances terrify me, even since I've adopted the philosophy of never tell me the odds. I'm haunted by it all, and will continue to be.